Fisto Hoppers. British Medicine 3 Time. Medieval Medicine 1250 to 1500. We will cover ideas on causes, prevention, treatment, care, the Black Death, and change in progress. Important the two C's continuity and change. There will always be questions asking you to compare time periods, so make sure in each video you listen out for words to do with continuation or change. Ideas on causes. They were obviously very different in the Middle Ages to now. They had some rational ideas and more supernatural ones, but people could only get their knowledge from the church. The church promoted the four humours. This was a theory created by Greek doctor Hippocrates. It argued the body contained four humours, black bile, yellow bile, blood and phlegm. Healthy people had balanced humours and ill people had imbalanced humours. To cure these illnesses, Hippocrates said you had to get rid of the excess humour. The Roman doctor Galen developed the four humour theory by creating the theory of opposites. This argued that if you had too much of one humour, you cured it with its opposite. So if you've got too much phlegm, which is cold and wet, you eat something spicy, which is hot and dry. People believed this for three reasons. It was an old, traditional idea and the church respected the past. The church educated the people and physicians, so it was all people knew. And you could see the evidence. If you had too much blood, you'd have a nosebleed. There's also the miasma theory. People thought that with all the dirt and waste on the streets, like horse and even human waste, the air became poisoned. And even King Edward III believed that the Black Death was caused by the filth on streets. This theory was also supported by the ancient doctors Hippocrates and Galen, so the church liked it too, and they could even claim that the air had been sent by God to punish sinners. And that's another idea of the cause, God. If a plague came to town, it was because you were being punished or tested. By the 14th century, the 1300s, astrology also became a key part of medical training and physicians began to use planetary movements and zodiac signs in their treatment. They believed whatever sign you were predicted which part of the body you'd suffer most illness and how it would be treated. Prevention Because people believed illnesses could be sent by God, generally people just tried to live good Christian lives by praying and going to church. But some went even further. Flagellants whipped themselves to ask for forgiveness and they did this during the Black Death for example. The rich had physicians give them a loose set of instructions called the Regimen Sanitatis. This outlined a healthy lifestyle including those things we should just do now. Eat well, exercise and take a bath. It worked with the four humours because it suggested balance. More supernatural prevention methods were wearing amulets and buying incantations and there were some who just rang bells to keep the air moving away from them. In terms of public health, there was some effort to keep towns clean. Laws banned littering and butchers had to clean. The rich could afford aqueducts bringing fresh water, but the poor still had to deal with the water supply being polluted with human and industrial waste. By 1370, there were 12 rakers employed in London, and they helped clear up muck in the street. Latrines and cesspits contaminated water supply, so laws were created to deal with the location of private latrines, and cesspits were built with stone to stop leaks. 
so there was some effort to deal with these issues. Treatment As most things, treatment centred around God. People said healing prayers, paid for mass, fasted and went on pilgrimages to tombs of saints to touch holy relics for miracles. There were also treatments to balance humours. If you had too much blood, you'd have to lose it through bloodletting methods such as leeching or cupping. Cupping was where warm cups were put on open wounds to draw out blood. If there was too much yellow bile, you could purge yourself by taking a lovely mixture of animal fat and herbs and this made you sick. If you didn't feel like doing those, you could always just take a bath to try and draw out the humours. Herbal remedies given by wise women or apothecaries actually did work sometimes and honey was effective in fighting infection on wounds. But it wouldn't be the Middle Ages if there weren't the non-medically proven but very specific supernatural treatments like putting a magpie's beak around your neck for toothache and using zodiac signs to determine your treatment. There was always surgery too and this made some progress in the Middle Ages. Wine was used as an antiseptic, natural substances like opium were used as anaesthetics and honey was used to clean wounds. Barber surgeons could perform complex surgeries like removing eye cataracts or tree panning. This was drilling a hole into someone's skull to remove the demons inside. Barber surgeons used wound man illustrations which gave advice on how to deal with wounds. Surgeons did improve during this time because in times of war their skills were in demand and practice makes perfect. When Prince Henry V had an arrow in his cheek, his surgeon John Bradmore was able to pull it out with forceps he designed. Then he dressed the wound and Henry lived to fight another day. But they couldn't fight infection with dirty tools and they couldn't stop heavy bleeding so patients still died from this. Care Like most things, care depended on your social status and your wealth. Wise women, local women with experience, were cheap and used herbal remedies and charms to help cure local villagers. They also helped women with childbirth and could train to be midwives. But this was only with permission from the bishop and they obviously couldn't be physicians because that's a job for manly men. Apothecaries were like medieval pharmacists. They were trained and experienced but had no medical qualifications. They mixed various ingredients to produce medicines for physicians but they were cheaper than physicians. Physicians were medically trained at university for seven long years using the best doctors in town, Hippocrates and Galen. They didn't use dissection because they were taught by the church that this was against God and tradition, so this meant they had little anatomical knowledge. There were only a hundred male physicians in England during this period. Physicians did take clinical observation, like taking your pulse and examining your body. They also used urine charts linked to the four humours they checked the colour, smell and taste to check for illness. For example, if it was white, there was too much fun. They also used astrology because zodiacs are useful for everything. Then there are barber surgeons. They were untrained but experienced, but they also lacked knowledge of anatomy, so used the wound man. They could pull teeth, lance boils, let blood, remove tumours, and performed basic surgery like amputations or removing arrowheads. They didn't use anaesthetic or antiseptic, so it's no surprise that their success rate was very low and they were the cheapest surgeons available. Hospitals did exist, and the first hospital in England, St Bart's, was created in 1123 in London. They were all kept very clean. They were set up and run by monks and nuns, providing care, food, warmth and prayers for older people, but there were no doctors or physicians of any kind. Over time, 
smaller hospitals were set up by wealthy merchants and by 1400 there were over 500 in England. These, like most things in the Middle Ages, were of course run by the church and so there was an emphasis on the healing power of God. Patients were old and poor and those with infectious diseases were barred. Hospitals back then focused on care not cure, so patients were made comfortable rather than treated. And since the monks believed it was up to God to cure you anyway, they only offered prayer. The Black Death This is a case study which allows you to see medicine in action during the Middle Ages. The plague, called the pestilence by people at the time, broke out in China. Then it spread across to Europe through trade routes and in 1348 it reached Dorset in England. By 1349, it had spread around the rest of Britain, killing 40% of the population. Higher numbers were killed in towns and ports because of the sanitary conditions. The symptoms were painful and things like swellings under the armpits and groin called buboes. There was also vomiting, blisters, high fever, headaches and fits. The living conditions in the 1340s helped the spread of the plague because people lived very close to each other in large cities. Horse waste was left on the street, the butchering of meat led to waste and blood on the streets, and towns had no drainage, sewers or rubbish collections. As well, the disposal of bodies was very basic, so rats lived and germs grew. Of course, when it came to figuring out the cause, Nobody thought about fleas on rats, but stuck to existing ideas. This was God's punishment, the planetary movements of Saturn and Jupiter, miasma from a volcano, and even Jews were blamed for poisoning wells. There were attempts to prevent the spread, with the government introducing quarantine to stop people moving around, and victims were stopped from leaving their houses. But hospitals didn't accept sufferers, and the usual advice to carry herbs and flowers on posts or around the neck were used to avoid corrupted air. People generally just try to avoid other people and seek God's forgiveness by whipping themselves or just praying. Treatments remain the same too. People rubbed onions, herbs or chopped up snake on boils and chicken's bottom on buboes. Some drank vinegar or ate minerals and tried to fumigate their houses with herbs. Physicians popped buboes to release pressure and also tried bloodletting. And some prayed. So how much change was there really in this period? Ideas of causes of disease did not progress at all during this period. Everyone sticking to the belief of religious and supernatural ideas. There was some progress with prevention, as there were efforts to introduce public health measures in cities, such as employing rakers. And the regimen sanitatis was used by the rich to have a healthy lifestyle. But towns on the whole still remained filthy, and the poor didn't have access to physicians to understand how to live healthily. They could only rely on the word of the church and supernatural means to prevent disease like amulets and charms. With treatment, there was an increase in hospitals and improvements in surgery, and some herbal remedies did work, but hospitals stuck to care not cure, leaving it to God to save you, and 50% of patients died from surgery because of infection or blood loss. And treatments were still heavily based on astrology and the four humours. There was some progress, but very little. Factors limiting progress. So why was there such little progress? The main reason is the church. They dominated the lives of all those who feared God, pushing forward traditional ideas of disease, as well as a religious argument that God sent disease to punish sinners. Back then, most people were devout Christians who based their lives around the church and God. 
Printing only came to England at the end of this period in 1470 and still even then the poor had little access to it. All they could rely on was for the church to give them an education, so the church's power remained massive. Anyone who went against the church was going to hell. And when the English scientist Roger Bacon challenged the church's views on medicine, he went to jail. So you didn't speak out against the church and they just wanted to support the respected traditional causes. As well, the king didn't get involved in public health. His only concern was to defend the country and local governments didn't spend money on improving health or medicine either. It was only during the Black Death they made an effort to get involved. So this could be seen as somewhat of a turning point. The end. Thanks for watching and remember to like and subscribe.